Can you imagine how cool it would be to be 13 years old and have your name be Arch Manning? What a great way to go through uh, through high school, man. That'd be that'd be awesome. Uh, I want to I want to talk a little bit about the '98 thing last weekend. So I've learned a lot in the last two weeks. It, it's it, something I I probably knew, but it was a good reminder. It's a good reminder for all of us that that love the sport of football. Two years or two, uh, two weeks ago, uh, Mac Brown came back. Mac obviously coached us in the late '80s. At the time basketball was going through its shutdown. Uh, went to North Carolina from here. Uh, was the athletic director, had not been back to campus since he left. Uh, we went out to dinner on Thursday night with eight of his guys that live in town. And they sat around telling stories that were allegedly were true, or mostly true, but they remembered each story from 1987 to 1988, even though while they kept in some contact, they really hadn't been in contact. And when he walked out the door and left that weekend, and he had a great weekend, it was a reminder that this is what coaching is about. This is how coaching should define, or how coaches rather, should be defined. Uh, we'll define Willie this year by whether he wins six games in a bowl game or whether he's eight and five or whatever the record. But coaches should be defined by what their guys are like and what their relationships are like 20 years from now, or in Max's case, 30 years from now. It's an unbelievable experience and it was a good reminder of what coaching really is and what coaching's really about. And then last weekend with the 98 guys, to sit down in the lobby and watch them come in and hug each other like they were long lost brothers. And watch them go around like a lot of them had their wives, some of them had their families, but it, it reminded you of why you play football. Because eventually you're done winning, you're done losing. And some people play for the scholarship and eventually that goes away. And even if you're playing the league, that goes away. But the light thing that lasts are the relationships. And as people fight football across the country, and there are anti-football people all over the world, the thing to remember, it was a good reminder the last two weeks, what coaches really are and what they really do, and what the game really means to the men who play. It's something really, really special. It was really cool to be around those 98 guys. Uh, Sean King is texting me, though, they're playing. Uh, uh, I think they played Georgia Tech on uh, early Saturday morning. But Sean's texting me Friday night, want to know what are the guys doing, what are the guys saying. So the guys talking about me, I didn't know Sean, they're not talking about you, they're talking about themselves. But uh, everybody was engaged in that, so it was, it was great. Uh, one more observation about last weekend, I was just telling John this. His nephew is one whale of a football player. Chase 4K, uh, we couldn't tackle him. And we got a lot of guys that can tackle. And traditionally, Willie Fritz teams, and, and since he's been here, one of, our, one of our calling cards is we don't miss tackles. We couldn't tackle the guy. Uh, that was a really good team. Uh, you know, I was in Northern Iowa eight years. We were one of the best FCS programs in the country. Willie had the best FCS pro program in the country uh, for a time at Sam Houston. And we both talked to each other afterwards at his locker room and said, that's, that's as good an FCS team as there is in the country. Chase is a top 10 FCS player, and they're going to go a long way. And the other shout out I would make, and, you know, I, I knew the Nichols program, not like you, but I knew it when it wasn't playing like this. Uh, Coach has done a whale of a job there, and to see what their fans and their crowd did at our place, when you could argue they might have outnumbered Tulane fans, uh, something to be very proud of, and, and they're going to have a nice run in December uh, in Thibodeau. So, uh, with that said, uh, look ahead for us. Uh, UAB, uh, probably a surprise loss last weekend for them at Coastal, uh, but they have not lost at home since they came back a, a year ago. They're 7 0 at home. Uh, we're playing in the middle of the day at Legion Field, so it's going to be hot. Uh, they tell us some of that hurricane rain may uh, wrap them itself down, so we're getting ready to play in a little bit of water on Saturday as well. Uh, huge game for us because the two weeks after that, three weeks after that right now, uh, at Ohio State and Urban Meyer's return, and that's certainly to be a circus, uh, you know, with, with everything else, let alone football, that's going to take place that week. And then we come back home, and I've said all along, our biggest game of the season is Friday night against Memphis. While well, Memphis got beat at Navy last weekend, Memphis is the favorite in our half, and you beat Memphis, you got a two-game lead on Memphis for the rest of the season. Uh, coming off a short week at Ohio State, but it is a huge game for us. And then we come back the following week, and we go to Cincinnati, and those of you may remember Cincinnati, we should have beat them at home last year. The one field goal we missed all year would have, would have helped us win that game. Uh, they're 2-0, they won at UCLA, and they shut out Miami of Ohio last week, and we go up there. So this, this stretch, uh, UAB, and then the next three games, are really, really, really going to, one, determine where we're headed in the conference, and two, what our path is to six, which is the first goal we chase this year is to get to six, and then go from there. Well, I'm talking about that. I was mentioned a little bit of scheduling philosophy. As Ed and I were talking about some 
things that we'd like to do. Uh, on an annual basis, we want to play one FCS game, and we want to play an FCS game against somebody that's drivable, somebody at Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, FCS team. Next year is an exception. We play Missouri State, and we do because the president is a longtime friend of mine, and he is a Tulane law grad, and as soon as I got the job, he begged to come for whatever opening we could find, and that was in 19, so that's why Missouri State's coming, which uh, will be fun. Uh, there's a lot of, I have a lot of close relationships there. And, and, uh, but other than that, uh, our schedule through 2027 is built out with the exception of one game in 24 and one game in 27. And the FCS games in those years will all be uh, local FCS teams. The other thing is we're building the schedule out. Our goal is to play one, what, I'll, say, I'll say group of five, but group of four, if we're into the power six uh, mentions that the American likes to have. Uh, we like to play one home and home against group of four. Uh, we have a good four game series with Southern Miss coming up. And you'll, you'll see that. And then we, the other two non-conference games, we want to play one power, uh, other power six uh, at home, and one on the road. You know, we have Oklahoma, Mississippi, Mississippi State, Northwestern, Kansas State, uh, all coming into our building over the next few years. And, and not into the dome, but into our building. So we're going to have a very nice, attractive home schedule, but it will be an aggressive home schedule. The one nice thing here is it's easy to schedule because everybody's fan base wants to come to New Orleans. So we've got a good, healthy schedule looking out. Uh, other things happening in uh, Tulane Athletics. Uh, it, was, it was just mentioned that, that uh, we have six new coaches. I think we have seven now because we just uh, had a swimming coach change right at the start of the year. Uh, we have 125 staff members. 103 of them are new since I got there. Uh, and that's not to say that there was a a sickle running around as fast as could be, but there's been a lot of change because we, we've kind of come in with the attitude that we need to win. And when I was hired, the president, I asked the president what he wanted about out of athletics, and I was expecting the answer is, don't get me in trouble, uh, make sure everybody graduates, and that'll be great. His first comment to me is, I want you to win. I want to do it the right way, but I want you to win. That's why I'm here, frankly, is because the commitment from the institution. And when I got here, there was a lot of talk about whether the commitment from the institution would allow success in athletics. Uh, I don't have carte blanche, but I don't get told no very much. And that's a great place to be as an athletic. I don't ask for goofy things either. But we've got all the support we need uh, to make things happen and to get the programs back where they need to be. We've invested a lot more money in, in uh, salaries, which you have to do. You know, we're, we're chasing Houston and Memphis and UCF. And, you know, Houston was, I think, paying Tom Herman $3.3 million when he left. Um, you know, uh, a lot of the coaches in our, I think there are four or five football coaches in our league that are up over two and a half this year. Uh, every basketball coach but one in our league is over a million in salary. So, you know, the, the salary game had to change and, and the universities allow us to do that. Uh, we're invested in schedules. I would, uh, so I, I feel very good about where things are at internally. Uh, there's a great staff underneath of us. Everything is about people, as you know, and I say the four cornerstones of success, wh whether you have them in athletics. Facilities fans, coaches, and kids. And the facilities piece was in pretty good shape when I got here. Uh, they invested $140 million in capital. And we've got some things we need to do, but uh, we have a pretty good setup for facilities. John and I were just talking the stadium. Stadium's a jewel. Uh, it really is. Uh, and anybody who comes in there will tell you that. The, the, uh, the coaches, I feel really good about the coaches we've got. Uh, we, we gave Willie another con uh, contract extension last year. Uh, because you know, I want to do everything we can to keep them. And uh, sometimes if it's not money, it's longevity. So we're trying to get him a little bit of both and, and keep him off the market should something open because he's the right guy for our place. He runs the right offense at our place. And he's a superhuman being. And uh, I like those in our coaching staff. So the facilities, the, the, the coaches are there. The, uh, the, fan, the fans, you know, there's a core group of Tulane fans that is second to none. Uh, it is a challenge to grow that core. And here's the other challenge at Tulane, and I didn't understand this until about a year ago. You go to almost any school from Memphis to LSU to any place else, you draw a circle about three hours around, and you, you get most of the alums. And alums are your fan base. They're your ticket buyers, they're your donors. You draw a circle three hours around Tulane, and you, you don't get many of them. You get most of the lawyers in town, as I figured out, but you don't get many more of our alums. You know, this year, Tulane, has more kids from uh, with a New York address, an Illinois address, California, Texas address, Louisiana address. So our kids are from all over the country and they go back wherever they're coming from. So you know, we have to market ourselves a little bit differently and we've started that. 
uh, started. I, I use the minor league baseball analogy. We got to have a better fan experience. We got to get price points way down. We got to get people in the building. And that's that's how we're trying to grow. So we rolled some prices back this year. We're trying to do some more more things from that standpoint. And then the kid piece, which is the cornerstone, the most important cornerstone. Uh, you know, I, I think right now we're recruiting better than we've ever recruited at Tulane. Uh, the, the the numbers, whether those numbers are valid or not, uh, hold that to be true. But we're getting good kids who are graduating, who are who are being successful academically, uh, and we're get, we're getting kids that can play in the leagues that we're in. Uh, and, and they're doing a good job of it. So from that standpoint, I feel really good about where we're going. Uh, a couple other things, volleyball, eight and three. Volleyball starts three freshmen and two sophomores. Volleyball's gonna be a really good program. You know, uh, men's, men's basketball this year, I don't know exactly what the starting lineup's gonna be, but I've seen them enough. We got 11 kids that can play. Last year we had six or seven. Uh, and, and so we got a lot more depth. Uh, you know, the goal is to take another step and then next year you know, we're gonna schedule like we should be as an at-large team in the NCAA tournament. So I feel really good about where men's basketball is going. The talent level in football, obviously, the, the recruiting class was 65 last year or thereabouts, and we've never been lower than the 80s. So we're getting the quality athletes, we're getting quality kids in school. Uh, we're not having any problem getting kids in school. Anybody that, that frankly belongs at Tulane from an athletic standpoint, we can get them in school. So good things on the horizon for us, good things in the present for us. Uh, appreciate your support, and whatever questions, uh, I'll answer most of them. Uh, Troy, yes. keep up the good work, but one question, and, and Kenny and Ed and, and, and the coaches up there being high school guys, I'll, and in touch with a lot of the high schools like Kenny and Ed are, I, I know it's Tulane opening up that stadium is just outstanding for a lot of a lot of high schools. Are, is there any more possibility where you all may open up the stadium even more? So I, I guess what y'all playing six games this year where it yeah. could be Maybe even even when y'all play home on Saturday, maybe have a Friday game, a high school game. Dream scenario. <laughs> so Thank you. some of you know, so last year we played our first high school games. I think we had four and then we had a playoff game or two. This year we have six and, and we've got playoff dates blocked out. So it'll be available for, for whoever wants to claim it as a home field for playoffs. When the stadium was built, there was a deal negotiated with the city and there's actually a resolution with the New Orleans City Council that limits the number of games that can be played in the stadium, major events, to one per week. So if Tulane has a home game, we cannot, by that agreement, have a high school game the same weekend. Now, I'm begging for that to be revisited. Now, this is at a level beyond my uh, pay grade as to whether the university wants to approach the city council about that. Whether they do or they don't, the university will make that decision. Because what I want to do, I want to play double headers on Saturdays when we're out of town. I want to play Friday, Saturday. I'd like to play Thursday, Friday, Saturday in the stadium. Uh, I, I, want, I want basically the stadium to be, you know, I came from a play, we hosted 48 high school football games in the Dome at Northern Iowa when I was there. Uh, there was always a high school football game in there, every Thursday, Friday, Saturday, if we weren't playing. That's what it should be at our, our stadium as well. There's that pesky agreement that we have to overcome. And whether that's going to happen or not, I don't know. I, I would look, depending upon how the uh, championship uh, discussions go long term, you know, there's a week in December where that stadium isn't being used at all. Boy, that'd be a great place to play some, some state championship games as well. That's outstanding. What's the penalty if you do go ahead and schedule those? What's that? What's the penalty if you do go to the schedule? It's a resolution. Well, I would, I would say this. Here, here's what I have learned in my three years in New Orleans. I don't want to aggrieve politicians if I don't have to. So, you know, if we're going to do it, it's like the president said, I want to win, but I want to do it the right way. There's a right way, and we're going to go about it the right way. Well, here, here's the deal. If you, violate, if you violate the code, I'm going to assume that the city has the ability to throw whatever hammer at you it wants to throw at you including whatever it may be. So if there's, a, if there's a penalty, I don't know what it is, but if there's a penalty, I would assume it can be anything the city wants it to be because if you enter good faith into an agreement with the city in, on usage of the, of, the, of the stadium, to flagrantly violate it, I think is something that, that none of us really want to be a part of, even though you'd love to do it. You, you just can't be a part of it. Yes, sir. Uh, Coach, this reference is baseball. Jewett came from Vanderbilt going into his third year 
you know, they're limited, the baseball team's limited 11.7 scholarships. Kids coming into Tulane have to pay $73,000 in essence. So where are we going to get the money to get quality baseball players to carve up that 11.7 scholarships to 25, 27 players? So here's what, you know, first thing we do, you talk about the actual one, a 1 1.0 scholarship is $71,500 this year. That's not counting summer school in which every athlete stays behind and we pay for that as well. So if we offer a kid a 50% baseball scholarship, which is extraordinarily high, right? That's a, that's a catcher, a shortstop, a center fielder, or a pitcher, basically. Uh, it, it's still cheaper for them to walk on at LSU than it is to come to Tulane from a high hit on the pocketbook. The difference that Vanderbilt and Rice have is they have $5 billion endowments and if a kid displays need, financial need, they can qualify for basically a full scholarship. The year Vandy won their national championship, none of their infielders were on baseball scholarships. They were on full need scholarships from the institution. Tulane only offers up to half need. So even in the case where, a, let's say, a, a certain student was completely destitute, the university will give you, his, and he was a 36 ACT, he can qualify for half. And NCAA rules sometimes prohibit, depending on what half he's getting, whether it be merit or need, as to whether we can stack on top of that. So there are limitations that, one, are NCAA imposed, two, are just who we are as an institution. Look at private schools across the country in baseball right now, and I'll tell you, they're all struggling. And the publics, the publics are not, just because of the economics of it. So as we've talked, our recruiting universe in baseball at Tulane is like this. At, at Southeastern or at LSU, it's like this. But we've got to recruit really, really smart or really, really wealthy if they're not going to get a high percentage scholarship. And so that means we're recruiting in California, we're recruiting all over the country because we, it's, it's more like the Stanford model for how Stanford recruits. We can't stay as close to home, as good as the baseball is close to home. We've got to spread out just because of those qualifications. Our 11-7 last year was split among 19 kids. The NCAA allows you to split it among 27. So we've got, in that case, with a roster of 35, we had 16 kids that were getting no athletic aid last year on the baseball roster. And that's probably the way it's going to look, just because of the financials of it. We can't do something for baseball that the institution doesn't do for everybody. So what we're trying to do is, and, and Travis has done a really good job of this, is finding these little off, one-off scholarships that are available inside the university. I said, as an example, if, if there's a scholarship for a, a blue-eyed Cuban left-hander, Travis has found it and he's recruiting a blue-eyed left-handed Cuban. Uh, so trying to find ways to recruit into what we have available uh, is, is really the, the best counter to that that we have. Appreciate your support of the quarterback club. And, and uh, one other thing as I walk away, a lot of the members of the New Orleans Sports Foundation are here. It has been a pleasure to partner with them as much as we have since I got here. I think we're the host institution for the men's and women's Final Fours coming up, but it is a great partnership, great relationship, and I hope you all understand what they do for this city because it's something that I don't think any other city in the country has, and so salute to, to everyone at the Sports Foundation. Thanks.